Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're dealing with the tabernacle furniture this week, and there will be some slides further on, and uh, Simon's going to keep us right. He'll uh, move it along. Uh, we can have the first one, actually. Um, so there it is. So last week, uh, Manexia uh, showed us this tabernacle structure that was given to this ancient church in the wilderness. Do you remember that the Jesus had rescued them out of Egypt, he brought them through the Red Sea, and the, he was saying, right, let's now go to this mountain, and we're all going to go up this mountain, I'll lead you up the mountain, meet with my Father, who's going to come down from heaven, and we're going to, you're going to hear his voice, and then the time comes, and everyone shrinks back, they don't want to go up the mountain, and then it's almost like the Lord says, okay, haven't understood what's been going on, so I have to take you back to school. And I've got this school curriculum for you, which is this law of Moses. And right at the centre of this law of Moses is this big model. It's a model of, well, we saw last week, the universe. It's a model of the universe. And the living God says, no, the whole universe, very, very complex, very, uh, very large, vast, and you think, oh, who could, who could sum up the universe? Who could explain the whole universe to us? And the living God says, well, I can. And I can do it in this little model that even children, children will understand. And they'll love it. And they'll, they'll be able to see it every day. And you'll be able to talk about it every day. And this is going to explain all the deepest mysteries of the universe. This model. And we saw that last week. It was the structure of it. It's one room, rectangle, the whole creation was originally united, the heavens and the earth were joined together as one, but then there's this curtain which divides it, and there's a barrier now between the, the highest heaven and the rest of the creation, so the inner room is a perfect cube, and that's the room that no one can go into except one person on one day, and we might think about that next week. Or no, not next week. In a few weeks' time, when we finish Exodus after Easter, just one more left. You'll be glad to hear. But we've got this one room, inner room, which represents the highest heaven, and then the, the, the rest of the building represents the rest of creation. So it's the heavens and the earth. And we thought last week about the materials that we used for it, and how heavens, the heavens and the earth were all made of the same stuff. Even the place where the living God, where God the Father is seated, is made of the same kind of stuff that we see every day. It's all connected, all meant to be connected and designed to be united together. And we saw that all these different materials and things all told us different things about Jesus. Because the whole creation is really all about him and proclaims him. Now... Having that, that basic thing, here's the structure, here's a little model of the heavens and the earth. I don't know if you read through Exodus and you might have thought, it's a bit weird how it all works out because you think, right, well, get ahead, get, let's get going, let's make this model of the heavens and the earth, let's make it. But the living God says, actually, before you make the model of the heavens and the earth, I want you to make these other things. And you think, well, if the, if the tabernacle is a model of the heavens and the earth, but there's something that comes before it, because you've got chapter 25 there, uh, it says, right, I want you to make a tabernacle. The next thing is he describes these items of furniture, and then he gets on to talking in chapter 26 about making the tabernacle itself. You think, well, what is older than the universe? What would he want us to focus on before we come to the model of the universe? And it's interesting because this seems to be saying that before the universe, there were these three. Before the universe, there are three. You've got these three items of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, 
the bread of the table of bread and this golden lampstand. And we're going to think about those things just very briefly this morning and what they mean. But just think about that. Before the universe, there are these three. What might we be talking about here? Anyone got any guesses? <laughs> any thoughts? You can feel free to shout it out if you want. Interrupt me and say, what are you talking about? What kind of rubbish is this? No. Before the universe, there are these three. And uh, we've got, I think there's a picture here, so you might recognise this. If you like films, you might have seen this in a film. Anyone know what film that is from? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Anyone want to? Is it Raiders? Raiders of the Lost Ark? Raiders of the Lost Ark, yeah. Liz got it, yeah. I've Brilliant. seen it a hundred times. Seen it hundreds of times, yeah. You probably, most people probably have. <laughs> and what this item is in that film, and uh, the film, they're, they're, yeah, that, it plays a key role in the film. And that is from this book of Exodus. And that is this first item of furniture that is to be made. The Ark of the Covenant. What is it? Well, it looks, it's just a, like a box, a wooden box covered with gold. And on top are these uh, angels, like cherubims, whose wings are meeting like this. They're like facing each other and their wings are meeting. And that lid of that box is called a seat, a mercy seat. So it's clearly designed, even it looks a bit like it'd be uncomfortable to sit on, but it is designed to be a seat. This item of furniture is designed to represent uh, somewhere where someone might sit. And these cherubim face each other, and, and you can read about this in Psalms. Some of the Psalms and other places say, they describe the Lord as the one enthroned between the cherubim. And the reading that we have from Amos as well, that Revelation 4, you've got this throne at the centre of the universe, there's one seated on it, and surrounding him are these angelic creatures. So what do we think this piece of furniture is representing? And it's placed, where is it placed? It's placed in that Cube, perfect cube room, which represents the highest heaven. So clearly, this piece of furniture represents the throne room, the throne of God the Father. It is the throne of God the Father. This piece of furniture represents God the Father in the highest heaven. And he's hidden behind a curtain, unseen, only one person one day of the year can see him and go in and meet with meet the Lord who's seated on this throne. That's this first piece of furniture, and it's uh, it's in this wooden it's in this room that is divided off from rest of creation. So here we have this ark of the covenant, and in this ark are placed three three pieces of uh, three items: the Ten Commandments. The, uh, the manna from heaven and then this, this uh, stick that budded that's going to be placed in it later and we, if you want to know why those are placed in there we can maybe think about that afterwards I'm not going to go into that now but so here we have this first piece of furniture representing God the Father and that is his throne room in the highest heaven that's his throne in the next piece of furniture is a table of bread. And you notice that there are 12 pieces of bread on this table. The table is placed just outside the inner room, so it's in the, the long outer room, and it's placed on one side. And it's called the table of the bread of presence. The table of the bread of presence. think about bread, we think about someone who describes himself as the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. And he did that miracle, didn't he, where he had 
where he provided bread for a multitude of people, and afterwards there were 12 baskets of leftovers. And 12, how many tribes of Israel were there? 12 tribes. So this is saying, this one seems to be associated with Jesus, the bread from heaven, and there's enough of him to go round. All the, all the church can enjoy him, every tribe, there's a piece, and this bread has to be maintained every week, so the priest has to make sure that this bread is there constantly, every week, and replaces it when it uh, gets mouldy, and it's there constantly, and it's as if this table of the bread of presence is representing Jesus, God the Son. And do you remember when Moses was up the mountain and he said to the Lord hidden in the thick darkness, he said to God the Father, will you go with us? We don't want to go by ourselves, we want you to come with us. And the Lord hidden in the thick darkness says, I will go with you because my presence will go with you. And his presence is a title for Jesus because Jesus is described as the angel presence. And here we have the table of the bread of presence. So the, Lord's, the Lord, Jesus, is the one who's represented by this table of bread. And then we've got this third item of furniture, which is this golden lampstand. And it is, it's, it's this wonderful piece of furniture. It is gold all the way through. And it is, when it's lit, it is fantastically beautiful. And it is, it's got oil, it's, a, it's a, got oil in it to help it uh, remain lit. And we know in the Bible that oil is always associated with which person? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, you knew, knew where we're going with this, don't you? <laughs> so here is a piece of furniture that represents the Holy Spirit. And if you, uh, because when we think about someone who's anointed for the role of a king, or someone who's anointed for the role of a prophet, and most importantly of all, someone who's anointed for the role of a priest, what are they anointed with? Oil. And Jesus, when he's anointed, he's baptised, and he steps out of the water, and it's like he's being anointed from above when the Spirit descends upon him and rests on him and it's like it's saying that Jesus is this priest and king and prophet who's anointed with the Holy Spirit from the highest heaven. He's the anointed one and he's the one full of the life of the Spirit and so on. And then these lampstands, there is a clue as well in the, in the passage that Ina's read because do you remember it said round that throne, in front of the throne, there are these seven lamps, and the seven lamps are the sevenfold Spirit of God. And seven in the Bible is always to do with this, it's this number of perfection, completion. So the Spirit is perfect and complete, and the Spirit is this divine person who is, well, in that Revelation passage, the Spirit is equipping and empowering all the churches. That's because there are seven churches in Revelation and they each have a letter written to them by Jesus. And so seven, each church has these, uh, has this help from the Spirit. And when actually showed us last week how Bezalel, Martin read his name out for us, Bezalel is this man who has been appointed to make and fashion all the stuff for the tabernacle. And we're told that he and his companions are filled with the Spirit do the task that they're doing. When we think about that, we think about there's Jesus who has led the church from Egypt in, in the wilderness and he's provided bread from heaven and he's brought them up to meet, or he says, come up the mountain to meet my father who is enthroned in the highest heaven but is coming down to meet you. And then get on with declaring who I am and showing off this living God, and you'll get help from the Spirit of God who will equip and empower you to do what's necessary 
show off this living God. That's what's going on here. So we have these three items of furniture, each representing the ark represents the Father, the table of bread represents Jesus, as God the Son, and in this lampstand represents God the Holy Spirit. These three persons who've been together from all eternity. And so you've got this little model of, you might think, the, no, the Trinity, that is really difficult. It's a, it's a mathematical conundrum. Only very clever people can understand it. And it's an academic exercise to understand anything about the Trinity. But here in Exodus and throughout the rest of the Bible, it's never presented like that. Father, Son, and Spirit is always a source of joy and confidence and never a source of confusion and just lack of confidence. And here we have like a little model of the Father, Son, and Spirit that anybody can engage with. Children, older people, they can all have a look at these items and say, what's that? And have it explained. That's God the Father, the Lord, hidden in the thick darkness, the invisible God. What's that bread about? That is, that's God the Son, the angel of the Lord, who's travelled with us and rescued us and shares his life with us. What's this golden lampstand? That's the Spirit who equips and empowers us to walk and follow after Jesus and declare him and so on. This is what it's all designed to teach in very simple ways. And the placement of these three items of furniture is key. You've got the throne of the Father in the inner room, and then on the bit that represents the earth, or the rest of the creation, you've got the Son and the Spirit. The Father in the highest heaven, sending his Son in the power of the Spirit to be with us on the earth. Now here's, there's one last piece of furniture, and here we're finishing one last piece of furniture, this altar of incense. And incense, now that, now this altar of incense, incense in the Bible, just for an easy one, Revelation 5 verse 8 says that incense represents the prayers of the saints. And Malachi 1 verse 11 says that there will be sweet incense in every nation, around the world. So these prayers of Christians, prayers of the church, and it's like when we pray, it's like a sweet smell, a sweet savour to this living God. And it's like the, our, this, our prayers waft in and he's sitting on the throne and he goes, oh, what's this? My church is praying and I love to hear them praying. I love to hear them engage with me and want to speak to me in praise and worship. And uh, I love that. And I love it when they are engaging with me. And I love to hear their prayers. It's like a sweet savour to me. Now where is this item placed? This is the key thing. Because, well, this next picture, you might not be able to see it very well, but there... In that smaller inner room, the Ark of the Covenant, and then in this larger outer room, the table of bread and the golden candlestick, Father, Son, and Spirit. And then where is the altar of incense? It's by the curtain in the middle of those three. The church is positioned at the boundary between heaven and earth, it's where heaven and earth are united again, but even better than that, it's positioned right in the middle of the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this, this altar of incense is placed just near to the throne so that the, that the incense will waft in. And when Jesus comes down and sits, because he's the one who sits on that throne, in the tabernacle and represents his father, the angel of the Lord, the one who's gone with him and traveled with him, he represents his father in that, in that room. When he sits there, he is thinking, ah, when I smell that, it's like reminding me of when these people that I love with all my heart, when they are praying, and I love that. So how wonderful is that, that we as church 
are placed right in the middle of the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit, wrapped, wrapped like surrounded by them, wrapped in their arms, and we have all the help we need from these three. That is where we are located. And so, this model of the heavens and the earth, and there are other pieces of furniture which we might come to in the very last week, but this is the key thing we want to get. This living God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is proclaimed and taught, it's very simply, right away through the Bible, and here we have a little model of it, right there in the Old Testament, and it is saying to us that we are designed to fall in love with and share the life of this living God, this divine family of Father, Spirit, and Son. And in this little model, for everyone to see and understand, we can see that. And how often in the Bible are we described as being as close as we can get to the living God, or even described as being in Jesus, not just with him, but in him, and carry, well, we we're getting too far ahead of ourselves, because that's the very last one, when we think about the high priest and what happens there, but there we are, I hope that was understandable, and we're just going to close with a prayer as we give thanks for this living God who loves us, and who shares his life with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this little model of heavens and the earth in which we see you with your Son and the Spirit, inviting us to share your life. You with the Son and the Spirit are older than the universe. You've always been with the Son and the Spirit. And yet you invite us who have a beginning to share in your eternal life, to be caught up into your life and to be at the centre of all that you plan and dream of. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this and we pray that you would fill our hearts and minds with this vision and this very morning, if we've never done it before or if we need to do it afresh. Let's help us to draw near to you through Jesus in the power of the Spirit and to love and fellowship with you this very morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. With that in mind, we're going to sing this.